Good morning, everyone. Kevin here from Skywatcher, and welcome to another episode of the What's Up webcast. We talk about everything from what's up in the nighttime sky to equipment to helpful tips and tricks on imaging and visual. And of course, at the end of the month, we have a special guest on to talk about their specialty in the field of astronomy. Uh, thanks for hanging out with us this morning. Um, it is the end of the month of October, so we have a special guest here today. But before we get started, just a couple of announcements real quick. Um, we are at the end of the month, which means uh, the totem or target of the month for Skywatcher is going to be wrapping up here. Um, this month is IC63, the ghost of Cassiopeia and its neighbor IC59, if you get it in the field. Um, there's been a lot of awesome submissions. Um, a bunch of you already have your totem patches on the way to you, so thanks for entering. And we will be announcing on the website... Um, on Monday, you can go over to skywatcherusa.com under media. There's target of the month. We will be showcasing next month's target. Um, and then we'll obviously announce that uh, next Friday during the what's up for the month episode as well. Um, we are getting ready to design our 2023 patch. Um, so that will be changing um, here soon. Uh, so excited to show you guys that when we get towards the end of the year. Um, there'll be a brand new totem patch for 2023. Um, if you're looking for something cool for Skywatcher swag, we've got the skywatcher.threadless.com store, um, all different kinds of shirts. If there's something you're looking for, there's a place to go there. And then if you're looking for stuff to get, we have EQ6RI mounts in stock, Star Adventure 2 eyes, um, Evo Lux 62 and 82s are in stock. I think we even have some Evo Star refractors. Um, but there's all kinds of inventory um, available right now. And if you're looking to get stuff for the holidays, uh, now would be the time to consider that. Don't wait till the last minute. Uh, but that's some cool stuff that's going on right now. Um, thank you all for those who attended Seoul last weekend. I appreciate you being there. Hopefully you had an awesome time. Uh, we had 26 telescopes there. We had a pretty decent attendance. I know some of you walked away with some cool prizes as well. Um, so... Thanks for everyone who showed up to Seoul. Um, maybe we'll talk about doing one next year so or something similar. Now, um, so it's the end of the month. We have our special guest on. I'm going to go ahead and bring Ron in. And here we go. Good morning, Ron. How you doing? Hey, I'm doing great. How you doing, Kevin? Good. Thanks for joining us this morning. You're up in Canada, right? Yeah. I wasn't supposed to be today. <laughs> I was supposed to be in the desert in California. Oh, and Nightfall is this weekend. I always forget about Nightfall. So. I was going to be at Nightfall doing this call with you, but I am in Canada. I'm in my, in my home. Well, thanks for hanging out with us uh, this morning. For those of you who don't know Ron, and you should, and now you know him, um, he runs astrodoc.ca, and you're a world-class astrophotographer like i've seen you do talks i've seen your pictures um and it's uh it's pretty awesome i really i appreciate that and it's i mean i i i just look at it like everybody else i started just doing it because i love being outside under the stars you know but it's uh it's nice that it's gone where it has for me i, I love it so well, I ask every, find, what's up? find work that you love, you're never working, right? Yeah, exactly. I tell myself that every day. Some days it feels more like work though, but you know, hey, it pays the bills, it's still fun. But when you get to go to like events and they're taken care of, it's like, oh yeah, this is awesome. So, um, hey Ron, is there any way you can turn your volume up somehow? Yeah. I will do that right now. I've got you cranked up as high as I can, but it's okay, still me, quiet to people. Give me just one second here. Is this better? Uh, it's still quiet. Still quiet. Let me crank it up even more if I can. I gotta go to the to the settings here. Give me one minute. Uh, my, I'm gonna turn that way up. Try this. Any better? It should be. A it looks a little better. I think that's about as high as we can get it before it starts really cracking and stuff like that. So Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna try to put it higher. Try that. How's that? It's it's getting there. I think that's about as good as we're gonna get, guys. So Okay. Yeah, there we go. I'll lean in a little closer. Um 
So I ask everyone this question that's on, and that's how did you get started in astronomy? We all have our crazy story. Yeah, it's the uh, our creation stories, right? Uh, yes. So mine involved three or four things that all came together at the same time, starting with uh, my wife was pregnant with my daughter, Chelsea, and we moved to a house in the country. And the sky was nice where we moved to. I'd always been interested, but that's the first that's the first thing that happened the second thing that happened is after we moved my old bank wrote to me and said you've got all these visa points what do you want before we close your account and I ordered a toy train something else and I thought a toy telescope for my son but that telescope came and it was a four and a half inch reflector and I was able to see the moon and Jupiter and Saturn and I was completely blown away the third thing that happened is my daughter was born and she was colicky. She screamed like for the first year. And what settled her down is I'd put her over my arm and take her out in the driveway and walk up and down the driveway at night, looking at the stars and getting hooked. And then the fourth thing that happened is around Christmas that year, my partner bought me the book Night Watch by Terrence Dickinson and Alan mm -hmm. Dyer. I think that book got a lot of people started, but for me, chapter four on choosing and using a telescope was about junk scopes from Asia, and it had a picture of my telescope. So knowing the, the all these other things that had happened, I took my bonus money that year, and I bought a computerized eight-inch telescope. Uh, it was a Celestron Ultima 2000. And it was right around the same time that the Mead LX200 came out. Anyway, I bought that Celestron. I was strictly visual and sketching for about the first seven or eight years. And then I took a picture of an eclipse in 2006 or 2008, and then there was no going back. Then it was just like, how do I do more imaging? And I, I didn't realize you got into imaging... I mean, that's not that recent, but look, that's not that long ago at this point. So. Yeah, 2006, so, you know, 16, 17 years. Uh, and I, you know, I started actually with film. My my first planetary pics, I think I was using a Polaroid. Wow. Uh, and I did use film, and I went through all the cold film breaking in the camera and not being on the sprocket, and you get a get a whole roll back and just black with a few white dots. It wasn't pretty. And then when I started digital, I didn't know about raw. I just got JPEGs. Sure. So, so for the first few years, that's all I had to go with. But and uh, now, now you've got, you do talks on imaging. I mean, there's one of your shots right behind you. Um, yeah. 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 I, I love, I love it. I love it because, uh, you know, a lot of my friends, they're never going to look through my eyepiece because they, they sleep at night or at least they don't come out to my house late at night. Mm -hmm. um, and many of them don't want to go up a ladder or be freezing cold. But with images, you can share that with anybody regardless of whether they're ever going to look through an eyepiece. Uh, for me, I think we talked about this last time with Richard. It's the best thing is to image and view at the same time. Like there's certain things that just look better in the eyepiece to me. Open clusters for just about every open cluster. Globular clusters, they might look more dramatic in, in pictures, but the just seeing that light getting into your eye is much bigger for me. Yeah, my... Uh partner she does astrophotography and she's pretty hardcore with it and it's funny because we were out at a dark sky site recently and i had my 28 inch out with the night vision and she had shot a couple different like sharpless targets like the wizard and she likes these really dusty exotic targets um but it was cool to actually show her the wizard in the 28 with the night vision on it because it was totally different experience to actually visually see it um yeah. as opposed to just a, not that the pictures aren't amazing but it's there's something different about the experience of seeing something like that 
Yeah, and uh, just the fact that all those photons, they traveled all that way and landed on your retina with no electronics, nothing intervening. You know, uh, last week I had uh, Sean Nielsen, you probably know him from Visible Dark, mm -hmm. and Dan Higgins from Astroworld. I had never met Dan and neither had Sean, so they were coming up to Canada to, to go see a concert. And uh, we had them over and we didn't talk about imaging like hardly at all. What we did is we set up a 10 inch job yeah, and we went outside and we just gooned around the planets, which was great. And then we, you know, I don't have any electronics on my, on my visual scope. So I just use a flashlight and a finder and a map. And uh, we probably looked at 10, 15 objects. Yeah, I know the Ring Nebula looks better in pictures, but there's nothing like seeing it with your eye. Yeah, I was at an event or a star party once and someone kind of put it in a very cool way. Um, they basically put it as, we've all seen a picture of the Mona Lisa. You know it exists. You see it in books all the time, but it's a completely different experience to fly to France, go to the Louvre and actually see it in person. Absolutely right. And that's always kind of stuck with me because it's like you're when you look at the eyepiece, you're seeing the original, the real thing rather. Than, and yeah, it's not in color. It's not as structured. You don't see all the galaxies and all that. But the fact that you can just see it as this little smoke ring is like, that's pretty neat. <laughs> it's the fact that you can see it with your like unamplified nothing. It's like an, like we both play music too, right? It's like an acoustic guitar. Yeah, sure, you can plug it in and use six pedals and whatever, but the sound of that pure guitar or just from the guitar to your ear, it's the same sort of thing, right? Yeah, you the just get that. There's something very organic about it, so which is cool. So if you could only do one, what would it be? Would you do imaging or visual if you could? Visual with a big daub. Yeah, that is my you... ultimate like especially now that I've, I've had i know you have a 20 obsession and i had one before the 28 was done and that scope is awesome like if i had to pick one visual scope it'd probably be a 20 inch dog because it's like it's not too big especially now owning a 28 a 20 is like yeah that's easy so um you don't need a trailer for a 20 most of the time but it's big enough to where and i'm sure this is why you own yours that scope is big enough to basically touch anything you realistically want to hit so absolutely and i actually keep mine assembled all the time it's in my garage at least i'll like probably from march until december it'll be set up in the garage with the handles on it and my wife will hold the she'll hold the front end down so it doesn't hit anything but then it's like wheel it out take the handles off and stick an eyepiece in and you're you're away yeah easy easy so i i like the intimacy of a daub i've always it's like you said it's like an acoustic it's especially if you just have a basic one there's it's like you got the wood there glass it's just very organic and experience and just being outside where it's quiet there's no i work on computers all day long it's just i sometimes just don't want to deal with cables and computers and doodads it's like i just want it to be quiet i want to hear the wind go through the trees or the desert out here and just kind of smell and experience the night rather than it constantly just being another work thing so. yeah i i went through a long period of time where well when i got when i got my 20 inch uh, i had had a, i told you i my first good telescope was a computerized schmidt cascarin but almost right away i started like i learned the difference between looking and seeing right because when i started i would i was using the computer all the time and i would look for a few seconds and tick it off my list you know but when i stopped using the computer uh, i had to get to know my way around the sky and find it so i shifted so that i never actually logged anything as seen unless i found it manually mm -hmm. that led me to just give me one sec here. That led me to make a three volume set of observing logs that I wrote every night I went out. I would write it in pencil and nice. draw little sketches of everything I saw. Um, now, I don't do that in the same way for images. I, 
you know, on my website, I write up everything I did to process the image. Yeah. But in my observing log, it's more like what I was feeling or thinking when I experienced that view for the first time. I'm glad you brought that up because what I like about you, it's a very similar approach that I have. I approach imaging as like an extension of visual. Yeah. Um, where a lot of people, I think nowadays, they kind of skip the the hardcore visual experience. They go right to imaging, which I understand. It's a lot easier to get the structure and the pictures and all. You know, we're a very photographic based culture now. We want to share our experiences on, you know, all the different platforms that are available. But um, I find there's a lot of people who do skip the visual experience where you kind of went through the, the aperture stuff and you know how to find it. And that's one thing I actually like and really appreciate about how you approach your imaging. Not only are your images world class, but unlike a lot of astrophotographers that I see, you're not just a photographer shooting something and that's it. You're kind of there to your your picture is there to capture the story of what's happening and then you go through and tell not only how you did it but what it is and why it's cool and i wish more people would take the time to actually do hey i just spent third i know one of your pictures i remember when you were shooting the squid yeah. and you're like i shot a hundred hours on this and it's just like what and i mean now you don't have to do a hundred hours with the cmos cameras it could be like five or something yeah. ridiculous but um you know, why would you spend 100 hours on a target? And then you go through and explain, like, this is the squid, this is the bat, this is why it's cool, and blah, 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 blah. It was blah. only discovered, like, really recently. It's hard. So, and I want to see it. <laughs> and that's that's my, I think, the way I really like that you approach your imaging is you're, you're coming from it from almost a visual perspective. And well, that is just evolved from your your notes that you wrote down it's just now you don't have to sketch it there's a picture yeah it's interesting like i i shoot a lot of open clusters and it's because of what you said i just love looking at them visually so now i want to take the picture but a lot of astrophotographers really prefer galaxies and nebulas like bigger extended showpiece objects me i'm pretty happy to just shoot an obscure open cluster especially when the moon is full can't really I kind of took that approach because you told me about that a while ago and you know I used to not be a major fan of like globular clusters and then I like shot one and it's like I see why Ron likes doing these because different. yeah there's so many unique little like are the stars going to be more red are they going to be more blue like you know is there little details in there and you know I think a lot of people overlook clusters quite a bit because it's not this big challenging ultra faint ifn flux nebula whatever it's nothing there's not a lot of sexiness to it but you kind of just have to go back and just appreciate the simplicity of it sometimes <laughs> yeah and sometimes you get lucky so um you know uh carolyn's rose cluster that's a very nice NGT cluster 7789 well i shot that um in I think it was in 2011 I shot it. Everything's great. Uh, by that, by at that point I didn't have a website. Um, I was just sharing with a few friends by email, and uh, I sent that picture up to a buddy in Sudbury who's a mirror maker. Actually, he helped me learn how to make the mirror for my 10-inch dog. Mm -hmm. But but at any rate, I sent it to him, and he said, "Oh, I'd really love it if you could take." a really nice long exposure framed picture of this. Well, by that time, the season had passed and I missed it the next year, but the next year I went back and I shot it again. And what do you know? There was like the brightest star in the field wasn't there. Hmm. The brightest star from the original field wasn't there. And I immediately thought, Oh, I've discovered a star that disappeared or whatever. I researched it as well as I could, and then I wrote to Harvard, to the Central Bureau for Astronomical Telegrams, where you report these discoveries. Well, they never wrote back because I hadn't discovered anything. Um, it was a well-known variable star, W oh. by Cassiopeia. But how cool is that? Like, just the excitement of you take another picture, you compare it to the first one, and 
the brightest star in the field is gone. Yeah. But sometimes you just get lucky. Mm -hmm. So it's okay to go back and shoot things more than once. I, I've done that a lot, actually. Particularly because mm -hmm. different equipment gives something. Yeah, and you've, you've switched your, you know, I know you're using some of our gear now. I'm not sure what you've got. I'm sure people would love to know what you're running at the moment, but I'll you've you. switched it up for fairly recently. In the last couple of years, you've switched it up. So. Yeah, so I was using a 10-inch reflector, an ASA. It ran at f3.6, f6.8, f2.8. But I used mostly ran it at f3.6. I shot that until... You loaned me and then subsequently let me keep that Esprit 150. Um, and I just, like, the, the the focal length was almost the same, and I'm not personally crazy about diffraction spikes. Mm -hmm. That was kind of it for me. Also, collimation, although the, it held collimation very well, collimation is fiddly no matter, no matter what, and I never have to collimate my refractors. So I would say I've... I've really gravitated now to refractors for deep sky and I'm using a, so I'm using an Esprit 150 at native focal length uh, and I've got a QHY 600 mono camera on that and I use that simultaneously with a TAC FSQ 106 that has a one shot color camera so I get the RGB with the small telescope and I shoot luminance, H alpha or all narrow band on the big telescope on the Esprit 150. And it's really easy to register everything. And that's very valuable on the very, you know, um, short summer nights we get here. It's not dark till maybe after 11 and it's sun's coming up at three or four, mm -hmm. three thirty. So uh, doubling your exposure time that way. And, and it became really good once I kind of clarified in my mind what each scope was going to be for. Yeah. Right. So basically I used the TAC just for one shot color and wide field. Anything, any other filter I want to do, I use the Esprit. No, that's how we do it in our remote observatory. We have two 150s. Well, the second one's actually a friend of ours, but he lets us use it because his 150 has the one-shot color, 6200, and then ours has the monochrome. And it, it's all set up, you know, full seven position. Actually, it's a 10 position FLI wheel. Um, yeah. It's all loaded up with all the good stuff in there. But I, I've gotten pretty good at doing luminance and monochrome and then having the one-shot color do the color and being able to run both of those scopes in one night, especially on a winter night where it's like 10 plus hours of dark time. It's like, yeah, there's 20 hours in one night of data at that point. <laughs> yeah, we get, yeah, the, the winter nights here are fantastic for time if the grease doesn't freeze. Yeah. Now, when the last time I relubed my Paramount MX, I put in uh, airplane grease. So it's good to minus 100. The coldest we get where I would actually do any imaging is probably minus 35 mm -hmm. Celsius. So it's still cold by yeah. desert standards. <laughs> it's, like... it's cold by any standards. Yeah. You know, but uh, uh, that's what I have. So that's what I use. That's what I work with. Someone was asking, you're on a Paramount? Yeah. Love it. Um, it's going through maintenance right now. After 11 years, the, uh, the deck drive belt just snapped, mm -hmm. which is unfortunate because I had just received a repaired piece of equipment, got the imaging train going, and the next night the deck belt snapped. But uh, Paramount was able to ship me, or uh, Beast, I guess, was able to ship me a pair of new belts the next day. They're going to arrive on Monday, and right when's the best time for visual right now yeah that's we got crescent moon jupiter saturn mars double double the whole milky way overhead with dana uh sorry with um cygnus cepheus cassiopeia they're all perfect so 
it's a visual now, week. Right? Now's a good now's a good time to really start picking mm. some stuff out. Even binoculars, uh, like even if you don't feel like setting up a twenty-eight inch dog right now, there's so much binocular stuff out. Yeah, one of the best views I've ever seen of M31 was from a half decent dark sky in binoculars. Like it's amazing how big M31 actually is when you put some binoculars on it. And I don't think there's a lot of people who take the time, myself included, to really appreciate what binoculars can do. My my best view of M31 was with binoculars from Costa Rica. And it was almost I mean it was way up high. I wouldn't say it was overhead, but I was looking at it over the Pacific Ocean and there's no lights there. Mhm. Mm like it was portal nothing, you know, it was no light. And uh it overflowed the field of the binoculars. It didn't fit in the field. But yeah, nice know, pair of like 50 millimeter binoculars that yeah, could be busy seven, for a while. Seven by 50. Seven by 50. And it was overflowing the field. Yep. Whereas, like, in any, even in the smallest telescope I've ever looked at it with, it just kind of looks like a puff of smoke. Mm hmm. Right? Whereas in the binoculars, it had two ends. They yeah, were you can. Like, they were outside the field, but if you moved a little bit either way, you could see the ends. Yeah, that's what's like that's where I like the binoculars and you know, yeah, it looks amazing in my twenty eight, like, and I'm sure it looks amazing in your twenty because they're about the same focal length actually, yeah. but you just don't get the scale of how big the like, yeah, you can see dust lanes and stuff and maybe little globular clusters if you know exactly where to look. But a dumb little pair of binoculars in a half decent sky, it's just so you just see how much sky that thing takes up. Oh. Have you have you tried those? Um, well, Vixen makes them, but other companies make them too. The two by forty two, or two by fifty, binoculars. No, I think my coworker Jared has a pair of those. I think, um, like, but I haven't uh, used them. They're like a visual reinforcement system. Yeah, it's not really. It's more like uh, naked eye than like binoculars. They just kind of mm -hmm. give you like a magnitude boost. Hmm. They're pretty cool and they're cheap. They're not expensive and you can you can carry them with you wherever you travel, which I like. So I've seen them. I have to look back at them. I've never tried them. Uh, well, if we get together at NIAC or wherever sometime in the future, I'll bring them. That sounds good. Have a look. So um, going into things a little bit deeper, you're really well known for doing like pics and site workshops and all kinds of stuff like that so for people who are getting started into imaging um you know i know that's the big thing now is you know processing is the big side of it um what are your thoughts on you know obviously pics and sites your main thing but um what would you recommend for someone getting started and trying to learn processing okay so the first thing to do is to recognize that acquisition of data and processing of data have nothing to do with each other yes they're completely independent skill sets so you can suck at one and be good at the other and that's okay for a period of time particularly if you get good data good data never gets bad it'll be there mm -hmm. as you get better the second thing is is you've got to pick a piece of software to use there's a few options some people like photoshop some people like astro pixel processor I tried PixInsight in 2009, and I've never looked back. Mm -hmm. Now, maybe I could argue that PixInsight is better than something else, but I never try to make that point because as my partner uh, at Masters of PixInsight, Warren Keller, always says, it's not the plane, it's the pilot. Yeah. Okay, there's fantastic images being produced with all of that software. Just look at anything by Robert Gendler. Right. Um, yeah, he was like the pre Pixin yeah. site master. All the people that you know, all the giants whose shoulders we stand on, right? They were all before Pixin site. Pixin site is relatively recent. Okay. Yeah, the Maxim yeah. DL, CCD yeah. Soft. That was all like Robert Gendler, Tony yeah. Hallis, uh, Ken guys. Crawford, all of those guys. So. Yeah, Bob Farah, all of those guys were doing it before PixInsight. So it's not the plan, it's the pilot. Mm -hmm. Never. If you choose PixInsight, 
you will, if you're diligent, you'll find it fantastic. I mean, it was, I bought it once in 2009 and I've never paid anything to upgrade my Pix Insight. Now I have recently paid for a couple of modules, Noise Exterminator and Star Exterminator by Russ Cronin. Those are they're, Photoshop they're plugins, I believe. But that's not Pix Insight. They're, that's a separate company. Um, Pix Insight has hundreds of processes and scripts, about 20 or 30 of which you would need to use regularly. But there's really great teaching resources. So I'm part of a I'm part of a group called Masters of Pix Insight. We're trying to make all our students the masters. We do about one workshop a month. We keep them very low cost. Thank you to our sponsors for allowing us to do that. Um, but it's only 35 bucks to come to a two hour workshop. And we have a newbie series. We've just started the third iteration of our newbie series. There's no drop in interest. There's still a lot of people who want to learn. Um, there's a few really good teachers out there. And what I find is that most newbies want to learn from all of us. So um, I'm quite happy to send you to other people like Visible Dark, Sean Nielsen, or Adam Block, because they have different takes on the same, yeah. same kinds of tasks. And, and they have a different style than I do in terms of what the finished product is. And uh, one of the toughest things for a new person is to figure out what your style is. Mm -hmm. uh, because if, if you just wanted my style, let me take the pictures and you can buy them from me and then you don't need to worry about anything. But what fun is yeah. that, right? So you got to figure out your own style. The way to do that is to look at a lot of pictures on the web from a lot of people, some who you've heard of and some who you've never heard of. Find something that you want to learn to emulate and ask your teachers to help you find out how they did that, right? So if I'm a good teacher, I'm not going to teach you how I do it. I'm going to teach you how you should do it to get the result you want. Yeah. Right. So uh, that's kind of our philosophy at Masters of Picks Insight. Now we're teaching groups, so of course we we have to show you how we do it, but we don't just go through the mechanics. We explain why you're doing certain things and why you do them at one point in the workflow instead of at another. Mm -hmm. You know, there's certain things that can't really be done properly anywhere other than where we recommend you do them. So deconvolution is one. Um, if you try to do deconvolution in after you've stretched the file, you might get a very nice result. It'll be sharpened, but it won't be deconvolved. Yeah. Right? Deconvolution is a particular mathematical technique that requires a linear image mm -hmm. to work properly. And similarly, certain adjustments like changing the hue of things and color balances, I tend to leave those till the end of the workflow, you know? So uh, I guess I'm digressing. What I would recommend is find all those resources there's some really good free ones out there i've mentioned some already there's some good paid resources um come check out one of our workshops we actually have a workshop on uh, november the 8th the third one in our newbie series it's called dialing down the noise and it's all about what noise is what it looks like what it doesn't look like how to reduce noise without destroying real legitimate structure you know, so um, that's how you learn and be prepared to take a long time, ask a lot of questions and keep remembering good data never goes bad. Are these uh, virtual workshops or in person? They're all virtual. We used to do them in person and we'd get 30 people that would pay hundreds of dollars uh, to come. We'd spend three days together plus two travel days plus airfare, plus hotel, plus meals. Or now you can pour yourself a beer, sit down at seven in the evening at your computer and spend two hours with us. And it's still live and interactive. So the way we do it is um, 
when Warren is teaching, I'm monitoring the chat box, answering any questions that might come yeah. up. And Pete Pru, our, our third partner, he's kind of the uh, or organizer. He's making sure everybody can get in, making sure the prize draws happen well, and that all the technology is working and so on. So it's it's kind of a fun fun way to get in. Nice. And a very uh, we've set up a Facebook group for people that have participated in our workshops, and um, that's a really nice group. And just you know, in the last six months, I would say we're really starting to see a lot of the people that started with us. They're now give they're answering the questions and giving the advice. And that's kind of what we wanted. It's, it's nice to see. No, and it's, I was talking to our mutual friend, Richard Wright, about something like this yesterday, where I think there's a lot of people that just expect to go to a conference nowadays, and they kind of just want to know, like, well, how does Ron get his image, or how does Warren or Rahelio is a good example? You know, how do I just do that? And it's like, well, that's all well and good, and but you know, you or anybody didn't get to where they are at by simply just copying or the equation of someone else. Like all the variables are different, like where you shoot, what you use, how you pro like it's all different. Like you give me your data set, I'm going to make it look different. I give you mine, you're going to make it look different. So it's just kind of, you can be inspired by, you're a musician too. So it's like, you can listen to some album and be like, oh, I like that. But then when you go down and try to kind of make something similar in your head, it expresses different. And you put your the... own flavor on it, right? Yeah. I, I, I've i played with people who want to do it like the album, note for note. Mm -hmm. And every time they start playing it for me to learn, I just say, turn that off. What's what's that going to do? Play it for me. Play, tell me what you want me to play. Yeah. I, don't play me something else and tell me to copy it. Mm -hmm. yeah i'll just go turn the album on or i'll just go get one of your images and just be like see there it is if that's what you want it's right there yeah and and also you know if you look at my descriptions they the workflow isn't the same for every image mm -hmm. it's similar because there's certain things that happen in a certain order but you know sometimes i have h alpha sometimes i don't sometimes i have o3 sometimes i don't sometimes i put it in through the whole image sometimes in just one place yep so um and there's no apot button right there's no <laughs> you can't take a data set and press the apot button and a great picture comes out yeah and that's a big thing i feel like a lot of people are constantly chasing this apod badge when it's like i get it but you should just be trying to outdo what you did for yourself last time it's funny, I was talking to somebody about this just last night, and uh, it was it was in the context of uh, he had a student who was concerned about, you know, his images were getting picked at one particular website. And uh, he gave some really good advice to this guy. He basically said, if you if you want to compare yourself to anything, compare yourself to how you processed it yesterday. Mm hmm. Is it better today than yesterday? Is it better today than six months ago? Yeah. And I still have data from 2015, 2014, as early as 2012 that I go back to and reprocess and I get a better result now because mm -hmm. I know more. The yeah, data it's... Change, I change. We all change every day. No, I've, I've had some shots that I've worked with and i know the data set's good and then go back and um, a lot happen. I, I have an m42 image i shot a couple years ago and had some h alpha data and blended all that together and now i have what i think is my best shot of that target and region but i didn't really understand how to merge all that together to accentuate the detail that i wanted to but now i know how to do that in certain ways and you know go back mess with it but you know, you get better every day the more you practice with it. But, you know, you got to find your own rhythm and your own voice on how you do things. Because, you know, one day you could be a speaker at AIC talking about your workflow or, you know, like and explaining why you got to where you are with it rather than just being like, oh, well, I'm just 
another whoever you know what's your style so yeah you know i find i find people uh i think that advice to compare your work to what you did last time is way better than comparing what you did to what somebody else did yep i don't know if anybody saw rob gendler's m33 today or yesterday it's a combination of professional and amateur data I'm never going to make an M33 picture that looks like that. Yeah. Um, maybe I could, but that's his style, not my style. My style mm -hmm. is a little, maybe a little more subdued. That doesn't mean I like that picture any less. And I don't compare mine to it and think, oh, mine's not as vibrant or whatever. Mine is just how I wanted to present that object. That's what it, that's what the data spoke to me. Yeah, I feel like that's a very difficult thing people get wrapped, especially like the younger crowd that's getting involved with astrophotography is now you have this like world of like Instagram and social media where everyone just, you know, it's five seconds of yay, good for you. And or people are so quick to tear apart how someone approached an image on social media now because they're like keyboard warriors i'm like well i wouldn't have done it that way it's like well no one asked your opinion either so well yeah i mean i guess i guess if you put stuff out on social media you ought to expect that you're going to get some feedback yeah right? mm -hmm. uh, but i'm kind of shocked sometimes that like i'm not the best astrophotographer in the world but my stuff is okay but i get some real negativity in some spaces where somebody will zoom in to 500 percent on a star in the top left corner and say some comment about the edge of the star like did you miss the object in the middle of the picture because that's what the picture was of yeah or telling me that you know my image is way too noisy or it's too smooth okay it's too noisy for your taste it's too smooth for your taste. But I didn't ask you. Yeah. Here's I what I think this. it should look like. <laughs> I didn't do that for you. I did it for me. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, the only place I would ever make a kind of comment like that, there's a few people, and I mean a very few people, that when I think I've finished an image, I'll send it to them. Because I normally wait a day anyway, because when I come back, I might see something else. But I'll send it to them, and often I'll get a comment that says, oh, I think you could bring out more of that background dust or whatever. And, you know, I'll look at it again and maybe try. But there I'm asking you. I'm asking you, what would you change about this picture? Mm -hmm. When I put out that final picture, I, I don't care what you think I should change. Yeah. Make your own picture and have it any way you want. Exactly. Like, you can go out and shoot it whatever way you want to shoot it and that's how you can approach it point, i'm happy to teach you how to drive pix insight to make it look how you want it to look yeah no it's it's i feel like a lot of us you know when you get pretty deep into this sometimes you just forget what it's like to be new or you forget what it's like to just have that origin of how we got here and i feel like a lot of people do get jaded where it's like well i just produce an apod every night it's like well good for you or whatever but it's just like okay but well that's I not what it's about an APOD, but four of my students have yeah and and there's and the four that have had apods came to me as relative beginners with pix insight so there's nothing more satisfying for a teacher than when their students are successful yeah, that's actually a cool, a cool way of approaching it where it's, you know, no, I don't have, I've seen that too. I've had people who've come out and started with telescopes with me and, you know, I, I don't like having a, I know people know me because of the webcast now. I don't like having the attention on me, but I think it's really cool to see other people that I've helped grow get to a place where they're recognized or what they, whether that's just in their little local community doing outreach or they're producing world-class images. So. Well, if you ever have any doubt whether you've had an impact, there's no better way to evaluate that than to see what your students have done with what, what you showed them. 
Yeah. No, that's that's a good way of putting it. It's not like how many A pods have I had. It's you know, like how many people well, have I affected for us. positively. We haven't had any between us, right? <laughs> no, nope. I've submitted a couple, and yeah, I just think there's too much emphasis on it. There's a lot of people who just that's like their goal, and I guess that's not a terrible goal, but it's there are. Don't forget why you do it in the first place. So. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I just. I love being outside with the equipment. I like being under the stars. And it's one of the reasons why it's it's very rare that I process anybody else's data and post it as my you know, my own picture. Yeah. I did recently I do for a couple of southern objects. So I did Omega Centauri and the and the Tarantula Nebula recently and I'm doing a narrow band tarantula right now. And obviously I can't get those from where I am. Yeah. But that's why I'm why that's why they're interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, but they're still kind of in the back of the queue. Yeah, they're at the back of the line. To I've got an open cluster I'm working on. Mm-hmm. Much less interesting to everybody else, but I I actually bagged it myself. Yeah, you like it. Yeah. Well, now we're getting close to the end of the episode. There's a couple questions in here for you, and then I have one big one. Um, okay. So one of these is, uh, I think we've cut uh, most of them, but do you do any H-alpha solar imaging? Yes, I do. Um, I have a, a solar view scope, 50 millimeter unobstructed H-alpha scope, and it goes back to the very early days of Coronado when Coronado was based in the Isle of Man. And they split in two. One became the Coronado that you know. The other one became Solar Scope. And mm-hmm. I bought a Solar Scope. My serial number is 22. And um, I got a really nice picture of, uh, of the Venus transit in 2012. Am I able to share my screen if I can find it? Uh, you should be able to. Let, let, let me, me find know. it first. Let's just keep talking. If I can find it, I'll show it to you. But yeah, those, those filters are pretty rare here in North America. I We were at the Venus Transit, uh, and someone, it was the first one I'd ever seen in person, but they had a hand-matched double-stack 70 set, and the view through that was insane how good oh, those wow. filters are. So. Uh, it says the host disabled participant screen sharing. Oh, you got your image ready? Yeah, it's ready. Uh, let me cancel all of the. Let's see. Oh, it doesn't matter. I mean, it's just a picture of the sun. <laughs> I think it should be active now. Oh, yeah, it is. So quickly, here, here's the Venus transit. Oh, wow. That's actually pretty awesome. So that always blows me away how big Venus is during that. So yeah, that was done with a one-shot color Celestron um, next next image five, and uh, I think it's the best two hundred of five thousand images, and it really came out quite nice. Yeah, that's it looks pretty, especially for a one-shot color. That's very nice. Looking. I've only ever done one-shot color. So yeah, I do some solar imaging, but I'll tell you what, just like everything else, I prefer visual. Yeah, I kind of gave up on solar imaging because of, because I just like, I've got a double stack 90, I've got a 0.4 day star, they're monster filters with a camera on them. I just like looking. Yeah, me too. So my friend Simon Tang is a pro at, solar so you want to go see solar just go to simon he knows what he's doing so yeah yeah I can't uh, know, but it takes me like five seconds to put that little refractor on my eq6 i have a, a really old eq6 mm-hmm. it's very little time to get that for visual or i could spend another 30 minutes getting it ready to shoot an image by which time it may be cloudy yeah uh, I just like to pop it out. I just like pop it out. It's like an IP sim. Wow. Ready to go. Yeah. Um, another question for you is what skies are you under? Like how good are your skies now? Uh, about a Bortle 4 is uh, my best part of my sky. Um, most of my sky is probably about more like a 5. 
So nice. I have uh, the city of Guelph is kind of in the east. So I just wait for things to rise, rise above. And then once they're above 30 degrees, I can go in my western sky. That's the better sky. On a, on a good transparent night, I have nice Milky Way. Not blow your head off or anything. But you can see the Milky Way through Cassiopeia and all the way down into Sagittarius. Nice. Yeah. Um, now, my question, because I don't see any more floating around at the moment for you. The Hawaiian shirts. Oh, the Hawaiian shirts. Yeah, this is like a big thing that happens at AIC, but I don't know the background. For those of you who don't know what AIC is, it's the Advanced Imaging Conference. But um, I don't actually know. It's like a thing. Like Richard Wright does it. You do it. Warren does it. It's like a ton of people show up and do it. And I don't know the lineage of why. Well, I don't know the exact lineage of AIC. I don't want to take credit for starting it there because I've only been to a couple of AICs. But I can take credit for shaming people into bringing Hawaiian shirts yes. and doing it in on mass. Um, I'll tell you how I started. So when I when I was a kid, first of all, like just for six months when I was twelve, I lived in Hawaii. And in Honolulu and every Friday is Aloha day there. So all the men wear Aloha shirts and all the women wear mumus. So now fast forward to me as an adult playing in a band, the exceptions. And whenever we gigged, we wore Hawaiian shirts. And then, um, and it was, we were gigging, you know, a couple of times a month. It wasn't a Friday thing. Uh, but then in 2009, my bass player died suddenly. He mm -hmm. had a brain aneurysm and he died. And I, I decided at that point that I was going to resurrect it. That was in 2009. So I've been wearing a Hawaiian shirt every Friday since 2009. However, That's pretty cool. Everybody else didn't really know about that unless you happen to be with me at a conference until the pandemic. Yeah. When the pandemic started... Uh, I started around March 2020 doing a Friday post. You know how we all felt kind of helpless and um, like things were kind of out of our control, especially at the beginning. And I felt that, I, like I'm a very positive person by nature, and I just felt like something that was in my control was to put on a nice shirt every Friday and just spread some goodness out there somehow yeah and um so i've been doing it online every friday since march 2020 nice and uh it's partly you know it's not really just for everybody else it's my therapy too it's part of the way that it's part of the way that i managed to get up every morning and have a positive outlook and have a plan and um Remind people that even when the shit, there's a lot of shit happening around us right now. Mm -hmm. But you still have the ability to get up every day. If you're fortunate like we are, nobody bombed my house today. Yeah. I'm going to have a nice supper tonight. If you're lucky enough to be one of those people, you better remind yourself once in a while um, how, how, special it is to be in that boat and um maybe maybe raise the tide for a few other people if you can well, that's a good way of putting it and you know i've dealt with customer service for a long time too and you know you get people who are upset it's like i didn't get my mount and why isn't it here yet it's like dude you spent two thousand dollars on a piece of astronomy hardware like we appreciate it we definitely want it to work if there's issues but ultimately like you said you're in a position where even if you spent $500 on a tracker, you have the disposable income and the life that provides you the ability to do that. Yeah. Your issue of your mount not quite working the way you want it or it arrived late or whatever is so low on the totem pole of everything else in the world. So it's a, yeah, is it nice? Do we want our stuff to work? Does it suck that the belts on your Paramount broke? Like, sure, that yeah. puts me back a little bit, but it is nothing compared to a lot of other people's problems out there. So, And everything that I want to look at with my Paramount is still going to be there 
when it's fixed or it'll be back next year that's what i've told some people it's like the stars aren't going anywhere and if they do you need to let me know so yeah but i mean sometimes like supernovas sometimes you want to catch those comets especially there's times there there are times but most of the time tomorrow is soon enough you know soon come. yeah <laughs> no that the jeff we need i was actually joking with jeff my boss at aic that we need to get like custom black and white floral hawaiian shirts for skywatcher where they say skywatcher on them but they're custom like monochrome it would be fab- uh, that would be fabulous come on jeff are you there jeff <laughs> He's watching. I'm going to oh, bug him good. after this. So it's <laughs> but yeah, we need them. So I'd wear them. So. I, would wear, but I, I, I will wear one on a Friday. Yeah. So that's it's a good way of putting it. And if you haven't been to Hawaii, you got to go there. I love Hawaii. But I love Hawaii because I think my mindset matches a lot of how it just is over there. Where it's like, you know what? Everything's okay, ultimately. Like, no one's in a major rush there. It's just like, dude, it's fine it's okay so yeah and i guess that shirt kind of em- emphasizes that lifestyle a little bit where it's like it's okay so and you know it's possible to kind of marry that point of view with also being effective and being efficient and getting stuff done yeah because because if you don't get too upset about the stuff that goes wrong it's easier to shift away from it to something that's going to go right yeah so i I know some of you know this. I told Ron about this earlier. Um, last Friday, someone broke into my trailer and stole eighteen thousand dollars worth of my equipment, all my eyepieces, a mount, a Lunt telescope, bunch of stuff. Right before Soul, um, yeah, I was upset. But you know, a week later, I'm trying to get it fixed up. It's just stuff. It's all re- everything that they took was replaceable, and I'm working on it getting replaced. But it's just stuff. I'm still upset about it, but it's just stuff. So. Yeah. Well, that that really hits home for me. Uh, probably some people on here know why I'm not in California today. Mm-hmm. I had a heart attack on October 10th. What yeah. The hell? Like I'm the poster child for eating right, bicycling, good weight, don't smoke. What the hell? I had a freaking heart attack on the 10th. So, yeah, it's just stuff. I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're feeling good. So. I'm feeling great. I am. But, hey, you know, man, I got a cool guitar to play in the back. and you know. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, I did get a cool guitar. But I, that wasn't like a heart attack consolation prize. I bought that before the heart attack. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So <laughs> it's, but, I mean, I guess the nice, ultimately the positive thing is you woke up this morning and we get to hang out this morning. And that's kind of the, you'll get to have dinner with your family tonight and, Sometimes you just got to take it. So. Yeah, that's, well, I don't have a choice. Most yeah. of us don't have a choice about, we don't have a choice about stuff that's out of control. Yeah, so you no. just learn to, that's I think one of the main things I like about astronomy ultimately, and it, it kind of keeps you grounded, especially when the people that I meet who are really into it, like really rooted in it, it's, it's not even a hobby. It's, this is a lifestyle where it's just yeah. like, you know what? I only have a short time here, and I'd appreciate what I'm seeing. So. Yeah, exactly. But, well, right on, Ron. Thanks for hanging out with us. That pretty much wraps up our hour. So, um, thanks for hanging out. If they want to know more about how to get involved with your um, oh, seminars, yeah. how do they do that? Mastersofpixinsight.com. Mastersofpixinsight.com. So, what you'll find there, you can sign up for our workshops. You can sign up for one workshop or for a whole series. If you buy one workshop, you get access to all of our free workshops, which we do at least once a quarter. Um, there's a, we can also, uh, we also offer one-on-one lessons, both Warren and I. And there's a subscription service, IP for AP, Image Processing for Astrophotography. That's hundreds of little tutorials on you know, two to 10 minutes long, some occasionally longer that cover very specific things that you might want to know about. And again, we have amazing sponsors for Masters of Picks Insight that allows us to keep it very economical for people. 
So check it out. Um, you can check out my website, astrodoc.ca. But for, for lessons, uh, Masters of Pix Insight will get you going. Perfect. Well, awesome. Well, thank you so much for hanging out with us and um, hope you have a good weekend and we will catch the rest of you guys uh, next Friday for uh, What's Up for November. So thanks very much, Ron. We will see you later. See you later. See you guys. Bye. Bye, everybody.